talking about electron configuration, which is essentially how the electrons are arranged within an atom. So up to this point, we've learned about Bohr's model, which showed the atom as having different energy levels in which particulate electrons kind of orbited like the planets orbit the sun. After some further development into quantum theory, Schrodinger came up with a set of wave equations that predicted regions around the nucleus where it would be a high probability of finding electrons. Those spaces where we can find electrons are called orbitals. Each orbital can hold up to two electrons, but it's not just as simple as that. There are different types of orbitals, and those come in different numbers of subsets or subshells that exist in each energy level. So since the first energy level is really small, there's not a lot of room. There's really only room for an S subshell, which consists of one orbital that can hold up to two electrons. And not coincidentally, that's why the first row of the periodic table only has two elements. Because once that's filled, we start filling up a new shell. And we'll learn later about how the outer, the arrangement of the electrons within an atom completely determines how it behaves. And it actually led to Dmitry Mendeleev developing a periodic table, which is based on elements in the same group or column behaving similarly. He did that without even knowing what an electron was. So this is the driving force for why things behave the way they do, or why atoms behave the way they do. In the second energy level, you have a little bit more room. You have room for a second type of subshell. You have room for an S, as well as a P subshell. So the S subshell, again, holds two electrons. The P subshell can hold up to six. So that's a total of eight electrons. And if you look on the periodic table, there are eight elements in the second row of the periodic table. So the number of electrons there, uh, capable of holding in an energy level will dictate how many elements will be in that row. Now, when we get to the third energy level, we have a third type of subshell that exists. We have an S, a P, and a D subshell. Now, these subshells, and we're going to see this on the next slide, aren't really just boxes, okay? They have actual shapes. And because of, like, for example, a P subshell, let's look over here, looks somewhat like a dumbbell or a peanut. And you have three of them on each axis, and they come together to form basically what it would look like if you took six balloons and tied them together. But that's how the, the probability of finding an electron would be in each of those orbitals. The D subshell is even more complicated. It's like got four lobes, and it's set between each axis, and cumulatively, all of this comes together to make a giant mess of a shape. But you can see that the S subshell is lower in energy. This, this is in an order of increasing energy than the P, and the P subshell has a lower energy than the D subshell. Once we get to the fourth energy level, we have even more. But something happens here. The fourth energy level's S subshell actually is lower in energy, meaning it's going to fill up first with respect to the 3D subshell. So there's actually an overlapping that occurs. And that's why, because if you only looked at the third energy level, you would say, well, there should be 18 elements. But if you look at the third row on the periodic table, there's only eight. That's a result of the fact that the fourth energy level actually starts filling before that. And we'll see on the next slide how the D subshell comes in after. All right. Now, this just keeps going and going and going and going and going. So let's move on. All right. So they don't really look like empty boxes. The S subshell is really spherical in shape. And the difference between the first energy level subshell and the second energy level subshell is just that on average the electron is going to be further away in the second energy level. The third energy level would be bigger than that. So it's kind of like a Russian doll in that it just kind of builds on itself. Then the P subshell doesn't look like three boxes, much better than I drew it. You have three individual dumbbell shaped orbitals and they come together to form a subset of that, which is what I was referring to. All right, so how does this affect electron configuration? Well, if you look at the periodic table, helium is kind of an outlier being way over here. Really, if we take helium and we move it over next to hydrogen, this is how it actually makes more sense. Helium electronically is arranged like the other elements in these columns. However, since it has a complete outer shell, 
it acts like a noble gas chemically. So that's why it ends up over there on our periodic table. So if you look at the periodic table, each row represents the formation of a new energy level. All right. And we can look at the periodic table as having four distinct regions. We have the S region, the D region, the P region, and the F region. And in each of those regions, those are the, the outermost electrons, that's where they're going. Okay. So the, any element down here is building up its F subshell, any element found in here is building up its D subshell, and so on and so forth. So, when we're writing out these configurations, we want to put elements, electrons in the lowest possible space. So if we have hydrogen, its electron is going to go in the first energy level as subshell. And when we write the electron configuration, the one in front, that refers to the energy level. The S represents the subshell, and the exponent looking thing right there, that represents how many electrons can be found in that space. Hydrogen has one electron as a neutral element. That would be its configuration. Helium has two electrons, so it's going to fill up that first energy level, and it would have a configuration of 1s2. Since this space is now occupied, an element with more electrons than that, like lithium, which has three, would have to put one in the second energy level. So lithium, again, starts a new row on the periodic table when you start a new energy level. It has two electrons in its inner shell, and then it has one electron in its outer energy levels, S subshell. Beryllium has four, so we just add one more. And once that fills up, we start filling out the P subshell. So if we're looking at boron, which has five electrons, the next, poss the next possible lowest energy space it could go is right here. So when we look at boron's electron configuration, it's going to have the, two, the inner shell filled out, and in the second energy level, it's S subshells filled up, and then you have one electron in the P. Now, if we have carbon, which has one more electron than that as a neutral element, it's going to have six. We're not going to pair it up like we did these ones. And this is according to something called Hund's rule. Hund's rule states that one electron will occupy orbitals of equal energy before any is occupied by a second. So, and furthermore, nitrogen, which has one more electron than that, is going to have one in each of the P subshell orbitals before any have any pairings. So then if we keep going, oxygen has one more. Now we're starting to pair up. Notice that the electrons in the same orbitals have opposite spins, meaning they're basically rotating in different directions. And this helps minimize repul the repulsive effect and lets them be near each other. We just keep going. Fluorine has one more. And then right next to fluorine, you have neon. Neon is a noble gas, and all the elements in this far right column have a complete outer S and P subshell. Any element past that is going to have to start a new shell, and therefore is going to end up starting a new row on the periodic table. So sodium, magnesium, and then we kind of go through the same process again. Now, earlier when I was talking about how the fourth energy level and the third energy level actually overlap, if you look at this as an increasing energy diagram, now the alpha principle says electrons go in the lowest possible energy place. The lowest possible energy place coming up is the 4s and not the 3d. So again, we're at the point of being argon, which is a noble gas. If you have one more electron than argon, well, you're going to have to start a new shell. It's going to go in the fourth energy level as subshell. Now, once we fill up that S subshell, then we start filling up the D region of the periodic table, which is what we call the transition metal. So, as we're doing this, notice we're filling up the 3D subshell. So, if I were to write the electron configuration for chromium, all of this stuff up to 3P6 could actually be represented as argon. Okay, so 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, that would all be just argon. And then what's left after that is 4s2 and 3d4. And we keep going until we have as many electrons placed as there are electrons in the atom. And in the next video, we're going to look at how atoms form ions by gaining or losing electrons to complete this outer S and P subshell and completing something called the octet rule. Did that help at all?